we'd like to continue the conversation now, try to get a little bit more specific on some of the broad themes and questions that were in the NDS and that were discussed so well in the first panel. And we have an excellent group here uh, to do so. I was thrilled when I saw the lineup, which I had nothing to do with assembling, uh, just the kind of talent that was brought in today, because these are really the movers and shakers, maybe one step below the big headline makers in terms of who's on TV, but the brains behind what's, what you're seeing on TV and uh, the brains behind a lot of what is in the national defense strategy we have here on the panel today. And then we also have some outstanding talent on the outside that has experience in these issues as well. Before I go through person by person, let me just say there are some common themes and threads in terms of the talent up here. Basically, everyone has worked big picture strategy, but everyone has also worked specific issues, specific countries and regions in their careers. And I, and I like that combination because it's easy to just get up here and say, we're going to worry about Russia or China or Martians or you know, extraterrestrials or asteroid strikes and just have a lot of big fancy words that talk about these new priorities, which always sound great and important, but it's when you have to start trading off capabilities that you want for new threats against concerns that you have in today's world and specific problems that are still there and are nagging whether we like it or not, uh, that I think some of the interesting choices get made. And so the panel today is very well suited to that choice. Just to my left is Todd Harvey, who is first and foremost in his career a soldier, but since that time has been at the Pentagon and doing many jobs, including the Iraq desk, the NATO desk, uh, worked on various issues in Asia policy and is now in holding one of the most important and crucial jobs in the entire Pentagon, which is the chief of staff for J5 at the Joint Staff, the strategy part That's of the Joint Staff. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. <laughs> we, are, we are very close, <laughs> but we're, we're really, together. really close. There's like no this. combination here. <laughs> That's like that was Acting good, Assistant yeah. Secretary <laughs> for Strategy Plans and Capabilities. And you can see why, uh, in addition to just being aging and a little distracted, why I can confuse the two. Uh, because the portfolios are, in fact, very similar. And now we've gotten two introductions out of it. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, Thank it's, you. It's Todd, and uh, as I say, Todd is, in fact, uh, by background, a soldier. Uh, and Admiral O'Connor is, by background, a Hoosier, Hoosier from the great state of Indiana, but he went to the yeah. University of Virginia, studied English, has sort of done it all. In addition to different parts of the world and different parts of the Navy, uh, he's really covered the landscape and his background in education. And just to his left, hailing from the great state of North Carolina, and previously in government at the NSC, the State Department, and the Pentagon, is Kelly Magsiman who is now Vice President for National Security and International Policy at the Center for American Progress, and has also thought about Asia-Pacific policy in her last major job in the Pentagon, which of course we've all been told now for six or seven or eight years is supposed to be the big new thing. And one question I hope she'll be able to get at is to what extent is the rebalance concept of the Obama administration still evident in the great power competition framework of the Trump administration. Do we see continuity or do we see change? And finally, all the way down to the left, uh, a man I call the Raging Cajun. He hails from the great state of Louisiana. He's one of the more soft-spoken and yet intellectually powerful people. So the Raging Cajun thing I'm hoping we'll catch uh, as, <laughs> as a little bit of. Uh, 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 and he's also in our academic rehabilitation and remediation program here at Brookings because his background is at Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard. And so we've taken pity on his uh, inability to land a good education and hope to <laughs> restore a little bit of credentials uh, to his uh, CV here at Brookings, Tarun Chabra who worked in the Obama administration on the National Security Council staff and also had been a speechwriter at the Pentagon for two secretaries of defense prior to that. So has also thought big picture, but is very good on issues like artificial intelligence. So we have people who know countries well and big strategy, who know technology, who know English, who have done it all. <laughs> and, 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 and almost hopefully made you forget about how I confused the first two panels <laughs> at the end of this. So without further ado, let me now work down the panel. And I just want to begin with a simple opening question, which is really what specifically is changing? And maybe can, if you can give one or two or three examples as a result of this national defense strategy, which came out in January. And it's a very compelling document. Uh, as uh, Jung Pak said earlier, it has some very uh, compelling prose, uh, catchy and powerful commentary on how we need to think differently about strategy, use our advantages differently. It all sounds great, 
It all sounds very Mattis-like, and uh, that tends to make me want to uh, applaud it. But what does it mean in the real world, in real planning? And uh, uh, Secretary Harvey, if I could begin with you for that question, well, please. Th thank you, Mike, and, and appreciate the introduction uh, and the promotion yeah. to joint staff. Like, um, <laughs> and and I, I want to thank you and Brookings for um, hosting this type of forum uh, and having these types of critical exchanges. It's important for us on the inside, who are very close to the policies we develop, to, to hear outside uh, commentary and critique. Not, not that we will uh, be able to adjust and get it exactly right, because I don't think, given frailties of human perception and cognition, we're able to do that, but at least not get it catastrophically wrong. And so, um, you know, with the strategy that we have now, um, the NDS came out in January. Uh, first, I would say that you know, I've been in the Defense Department for 25 years working in OSD, and more than at any other time with a national defense strategy, you have a leadership that is absolutely focused on implementing this, seriously following through and ensuring that the strategy gets injected into the bloodstream through all of the various lines of effort of the department. And so it has complete buy-in of the, of the secretary and the deputy secretary. Indeed, the secretary has... Um, periodic meetings on a, a very regular basis with the service secretaries and the service chiefs where they have to basically bring their homework and sort of present how are they implementing the national defense strategy. But I think um, from, from our standpoint, um, you know, the secretary is very big on problem definition as, as a starting point. And so what, uh, what we see uh, in the case of, of China and Russia, the great power of competitors, is um, over the course of the past you know, 10 or 15 years at least, um, a focus on the way that the U.S. Uh, influences and projects power. And the development, very consciously, very specifically, of ways to counter our ability to give them a freer hand to operate in their theaters of greatest concern, you know, their, their, their neighborhoods. Um, the Chinese, they call it sort of counter-intervention approach. And so that's the development of all these capabilities that we've seen in terms of anti-satellite, uh, cyber capabilities, integrated air and missile defenses, uh, long-range precision fires, stealth capabilities, all those are designed to limit our maneuver room and to give them a freer hand to operate in those. So that poses a challenge to the Defense Department. How do we respond to that? And the strategy sort of lays out in very broad terms, as Mike said, but in specific terms, you have to look at this in, in different time frames. Uh, in, the, in the near term, you know, the levers that we have to pull really are how we um, exercise and circulate our forces through these particular uh, theaters of action. And uh, I'll steal a little bit of thunder oh, please. from Kat in terms of uh, a concept that was um, alluded to in the strategy in terms of dynamic force employment. This is a, a way that we will operate that um, strategic predictable but operationally unpredictable. So employ our forces in a way that uh, creates uh, challenges and dilemmas for our potential adversaries. So we don't simply do things the way we've always done, sort of have this stock schedule of we have this exercise with this amount of force, with this partner uh, at this point on the calendar every year. So it, it sort of becomes background noise. Look at ways to, to mix it up a little bit. And that's still, you know, we're still fresh in the implementation phase of the strategy. So this is a concept that's still evolving and being developed. But employing our force in a, in a uh, more unpredictable way, I think, is sort of the near-term step. Then you can look sort of near to midterm. How, how do we potentially change our posture? Um, the, the Chinese in, in Asia and the, the Russians in Europe uh, hold at risk uh, our, our bases and critical assets that we have. Uh, with um, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, and developing is very consciously to hold those. In. So how do we build greater resilience through the way we posture our forces? Um, that's a little bit longer-term effort because it requires working closely with our allies and partners to determine whether we want to reposition certain forces or whether we want to develop sort of alternative basing arrangements in the midst of a crisis so, that, again, that we complicate the calculus of a potential adversary. And then we need to look um, sort of mid to longer term at sort of how do we uh, adjust our force structure? What do we build new with, say, proven technologies, whether that's uh, electronic warfare capabilities, whether that's stealth capabilities, 
whether that's uh, air missile defense capabilities, whether that's precision fire capabilities, all of those sort of are on the table and we're looking at investments. And if you look at the budget that was released this year, there are investments placed against each one of those uh, capabilities and mission areas. And then uh, more futuristically looking out of the long term, what are the technologies that are still um, not fully developed, fully matured yet that we can invest in on an accelerated basis to um, test out what they can do for us and then look at what systems we can develop, whether that's uh, artificial intelligence, whether that's hypersonics, whether that's robotics. There's a whole list of those, and the Deputy Secretary really has, has made that his mission is to place an increased focus on those advanced futuristic capabilities to develop them quickly and then translate them into, into systems that we can deploy uh, and field against the challenge. Sorry, that was very long winded. It's very good. To, it's very good. Be, be, thank, thank you. That before we go on to the Admiral, <laughs> uh, I do want to, it was, it was really good, but I, I want to ask one question which has uh, been on my mind ever since I first heard about the NDS and read it and heard Secretary Mattis give a speech on it across the street back in January unveiling it. And of course, it, by talking a lot about great power competition, you're saying we're going to focus a little less or at least relatively less on other things, including North Korea which is in the news, now it seems to be a little bit more uh, of a hopeful situation and no one ever wanted or expected war, but war seemed an increasing possibility at the very time in 2017 when DOD was writing a document saying, we're not gonna worry as much about the North Koreas of the world. So how do I understand that contradiction, that apparent contradiction? Is it that DOD is sort of, to quote Secretary Rumsfeld, if we have to fight North Korea, we're going to go with the army we got already. Uh, and therefore, future planning is what the NDS is about, and near-term crisis management is not so much what it's about. Or is there some other way in which North Korea is subsumed within this great power uh, emphasis of the NDS? No, it's, it's a great question, and this is the dilemma that DoD faces, has faced for the better part of the you know, post-World War II era, is that you know, we have to be able to you know, walk and chew bubblegum at the same time, right? There's more than one challenge we face. I think with the, <clears throat> the great power competitor focus, I think what the secretary intended to do was to give us a, a, an anchor point that we can always sort of look to to orient ourselves, but not necessarily devote every last resource. We can't over-optimize for one threat or one challenge because then you open yourself up to risk. You're, you're really gambling with the, the, the fate and future of the nation. So I, I can tell you, uh, internal to the department, there are, there's a very strong focus, and the chairman has led this in his role as global integrator, looking across sort of all the, the key players, you know, obviously in, in PACOM, SOCOM, TRANSCOM, pulling them together and saying, where do we potentially have gaps in our ability to respond in a sort of what we call fight tonight scenario. And what gaps do we need to fill? Where do we need to invest resources very near term to uh, increase capabilities, whether it's chem bio capabilities? The real focus uh, in the near term with uh, Korea scenario is the readiness of our forces mm -hmm. and ensuring that we fill the gaps in readiness that uh, we've had the, the degradation eroding of that readiness over you know, 15 years of, of kind of 17 years now of, of combat. In, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's a real concern is being able to build and being able to assure that we have the um, capacity and capability to deploy the forces that we need. I think we have the forces we need. It's, it's really a, 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 a time distance equation to be able to ensure we can get them there and be able to respond if, if something happens fairly quickly in a, in a worst case scenario. Fantastic. Admiral, the same questions to you, but let me also just give a slight twist, uh, which is that we know that your, your boss, uh, well, of course, you both work for Secretary Mattis, but also you work for General Dunford through the Joint Staff. And in, I believe, 2016, the second year of his chairmanship, he put out a national military strategy, mm -hmm. which is classified and I think is still on the books, but I'd like if you could explain how the national military strategy relates to the national defense strategy, sure. because the national military strategy, of course, talked about four plus one. Right. And implicitly, the NDS is talking about just two of those five threats uh, as the primary emphases for future planning. So is there consistency? Is there a slight tension between these two documents? So thanks, and thank you all. Um, so. The national military strategy is directed uh, every two years, Title 10. So it, it's a requirement. So what do you do as you're working your way through a transition? 
So you need to put something out there. And so at the time, four plus one, right? So the, you know, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and counter-violent extremist organizations. Pretty straightforward. And what the secretary has done is, first you have a national security strategy. Okay, got it, whole of government, and the national defense strategy is, as we both know, as all four of us know from our backgrounds, just one small portion of it. And any strategic great power competition is going to be a whole of government, right? Um, and, and so, you know, to, to riff off what Todd was just talking about, the NMS is in review. Right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll go off and they'll decide what portions are releasable and what are not. But what the secretary has done is say, okay, got it. For 16, and this, these are my words, clearly not his, 16, 17 years, you've been focused on a violent extremist fight. Got it. When you focus on something and when you do it iteratively, you get better and better at doing that. Mm -hmm. The question is, have you gone off, and we'll just talk to the Navy for a second, you're really good at power projection. Got it. You're really good at short, no notice, I need you to go in and get this, or I need you to strike that. We saw that you know, a week ago or so. But have you manned, trained, equipped, certified, and deployed you know, forces capable of doing sea control, capable of maintaining it, and controlling access and ensuring access to the global commons. Because you're not just talking about sea, air, electromagnetic spectrum, space, cyber, simultaneously. And that's really what he's done is say, okay, I got it. And that's still part of that. That's part of the three. But I need you to take the strategic long view, which is kind of what you'd expect from any reading or being around Secretary Mattis is, okay, and then what? Or to what end? And so that's kind of where he's taken us. And so on any given day, any service, any secretary is looking at three budgets, right? The one they're in execution of, uh, the one that's on the hill, and the one that's being submitted, okay? And so it is a way of focusing the, this is what I have to get after today. Okay, I can talk in execution to varying forces, we want you to focus at this. This is the concept for joint operations. This is the way I want the joint force to prepare themselves to be able to go ahead and to do a near peer competitor type of fight, right? And I want you to look at this not as a one-off, but I need this to be a strategic, a long-term. Does that make sense? Yes. Then it's a question of the, okay, You've always bought these because you've always bought these. Now what? What's the next thing? And how does that fit into? Because it goes to what he was just talking about of the, hey, if we have to do something tonight, not just in a one-off, but in, in a campaign type or in a crisis, do you have what you need? And so, you know, because of the way the NSS and then the NDSS and after this the NMS and then the various service will come up with their own perspectives of, of this is how I fall under and this is how I support, you're able to turn around and the secretary and the chairman very clearly and very successfully went to Congress and said, this is the challenge I have. I'll talk a little bit about it in open testimony, but I'd really like to go into closed testimony so I can get you into the eaches. And so, that has come back, and Congress, to our eternal gratitude, has done some incredible amounts of moving of money around, right? Which we now owe them an execution, right? You can even see those starting to show up in some of the articles over the last 24 hours. What's your execution? How auditable is it? And all that. All stuff that we know that we owe back to Congress and to the American people in terms of how we train, certify, and get the voter forces out the door, how we employ them. Because you know, being strategically you know, consistent is, is the idea, or predictable, is the idea that, yes, we are going to be a global force. Right. We are going to be there. We are there to deter aggression, and we are there to assure our allies. Got it. But just because geographic combatant commander A, B, or C has always had you know, three of these, two of those, and one of those, doesn't mean they get it anymore. So let me ask a follow-up before I go to Kelly, if I could. And I want to, you used a Navy example. I realize you're not here representing the Navy, sure. but, but we'll, I want to stick with a Navy example. When I think of this new concept, which dates back to the Obama period, exactly. of envisioning and, and aspiring to a 355-ship Navy, 
uh, and I'll, I'll be a little provocative here, and uh, it, it strikes me as a little bit like old think, because the way that number was calculated, as I understand it, was what combatant commanders had been requesting or have been doing, and if we were going to properly resource that at a sustainable long-term level, 355 ships is the number, which doesn't sound very futuristically oriented to me. It doesn't sound like it's all that technologically supple. I realize, as you said, there's a tension between needing to have a plan and needing to get on with it and have some framework to do that. So I sympathize why that number is there. But I can't quite believe that it's going to still be the right number in five or 10 years, which, of course, is well before we would have gotten to the 355 ship mm -hmm. Navy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so uh, and I realize, uh, Mr. Secretary, you may want to comment too, but, but, for, but, for, but for the Admiral, uh, 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 could, could you explain how do we think of that 355 ship number just as one example of what seems to be a legacy number or construct, but now we're supposed to be taken off all these shackles and thinking about future competition with great powers in new technology domains, is that a number we're going to have to potentially rethink along the way? Well, I think what you would see is that it is continuously being reevaluated. That any number that any of the services come in, whether it's BCTs, whether it's submarines, whether it's fighters, whether it's unmanned vehicles, it's the okay, in order to do what? Okay, and then as you know, Todd was saying, how are you going to posture these forces? I mean, because putting folks overseas has costs, but it also saves you in terms of deployment time. It builds access and relationships and interoperability with host nations. Uh, and so it is, it is a continually iterating thing because it's an ongoing conversation, right? It's an ongoing conversation between us on the second decks, the folks on the third deck in OSD policy, the services, and it just becomes iterative. And then you go outside the building, and then you get the folks at the NSC going, OK, I got it. Now show me this. And then you have the conversation with the Hill, which then interjects. So it is a continually iterating number. The fact that it bounces around a, a various number, OK, got it. Uh, there are force generation constraints. Yep. There is lay down. There are those kinds of challenges. But let me just give you an idea. <clears throat> you mentioned the Secretary Rumsfeld, you fight with the force you have. You do, but you're not constrained by the way you fought it, okay? So when a crisis occurs, you have the opportunity to look down and say, what do I have that's in the vicinity, okay? If that's the target, what weapons do I have? What platforms are there? And then based upon the access, the relationships, and the national caveats of our allies, partners, and friends, what can I use? OK. Then using all of the intelligence that is available, OK, from the national down to the tactical level, across all of the interagency, how then can I take that information and in a timely manner refine it, which goes to some of the AI stuff that we talked about before we walked in here. You can sense the globe, that's great. What are you going to do with it, right? And then can you put it in such a format that I can easily transfer it from this collection of intelligence into a format that gets it to where it needs to be in a timely and actionable manner. And that speaks a lot to some of the things that you place upon the services, that you place upon us in terms of training, so that the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, got it. I got it that each one of you has a system that does this particularly well for you, but can you make it so that it speaks in the same fourth grade English, so that this system, this system, and this system can all use it and flow back and forth. So Kelly and Tarun, you're being very patient. Thank you. But I'm going to give Mr. Uh, Mr. Harvey one chance, since I just attacked one of the central pillars uh, of, 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 uh, of current Pentagon planning. If there's anything you want to say on that no, question before I, we go. I'm mindful we have the brilliant folks okay. at the end of the day. And I, know so. Ke but I, and, and I learned from Kelly for a number of years. We worked together in the last administration. But the short answer is yes, that there, is, there is no fixed magical number, right? It's all about the capabilities you have invested. In those, I mean, as an example, we have uh, a littoral combat ship, which we're transitioning out of. Um, great for presence operations, not great for high-end fighting because it doesn't have the weapon systems and it doesn't have the protection. So we're moving toward a, a more capable frigate design. There, there. So, if you're not careful, 
Um, you're right. You build capacity, and then they just become targets, right? And you're not going to have staying power. So it's building the right capability. Do, you know, is it BMD capable? Does it have electronic warfare suite? Does it have other capabilities? There is a physics issue, and again, don't know what the right number is, but the, the trend lines that we have within the Defense Department is because of the sophistication and the cost of new systems that we're buying, we're buying two new systems for every three retiring legacy systems. So our our force structure has been shrinking, uh, as a matter of fact, over the past 10, 10 or 15 years. And what, that, what happens when you're a global power, there's a, there's, there's a, a physics factor involved that you, you want to have forces that are able to respond to crises on fairly short notice. Uh, and if you have too small a, a force structure, too small a base, you're not going to be able to get there in time. So you need to have a certain size force. And that's really, that's a a policy and political decision about what you want to be able to respond to. What is your force sizing construct? And, and we've, we've modified that, frankly, in this current strategy about what, we, what the level of ambition for the force is. And it's, uh, and it's changed because of the way we've uh, recharacterized the nature of the threat, not to be able to necessarily respond to multiple regional challengers at one time, but to be prepared for a, a major um, near-peer competitor challenge and deter elsewhere. So, so the, the size is, is a variable. We want to have capable capacity, um, but it's probably more than we have now if we want to sort of meet our, our obligations worldwide. Super. So, Kelly, there's a lot on the table. I probably don't need to read <laughs> <laughs> my questions for you, but I am, I am certainly interested in how you see the legacy of the rebalance, among any other thoughts you want to offer. Yeah, thank sure. you for being here. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, and thank you to my colleagues uh, to the right for uh, such a great NDS. I would like to congratulate uh, you guys on it. I thought it was quite good. Um, you know, in terms of the rebalance, the Obama administration sort of pivot to Asia, rebalance, whatever you want to call it, I think the NDS is actually kind of a natural evolution of that in the context of China. Yes, yep. um, and it's a sharpening of the challenge ahead of us. So I think that in that sense, it's, there's a lot of continuity mm -hmm. in it. Um, I think going forward, there's a couple of big things I'd like to highlight. One is in great power competition, the center of gravity is going to be our allies and our partners. And so what I'm going to be looking for as you guys implement the NDS is really how you approach working with our allies and, and partners. And whether that's, you know, additional um, force posture initiatives in the Pacific or, or in Europe or whether it's, you know, access agreements, uh, some of the things that we started to do at the end of the Obama administration, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, to build strategic depth uh, in the Pacific for us. Those are the kinds of things um, I'm going to be looking for. I think the challenge that the NDS is going to present, and I know the Secretary was on the Hill today just talking about the importance of lethality uh, and the importance of investing in actual warfighting capability as opposed to sort of uh, things that we used to do uh, in the sort of early years of uh, post-Cold War. Um, there is a tension between warfighting investments, capability investments, and ally reassurance. So I'll give you an example. So. You know, an aircraft carrier strike group rolling through the South China Sea provides a lot of ally reassurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it is not necessarily the way we're going to win a war fight uh, with China. So, you know, that's going to come in undersea warfare. It's going to come in hypersonics, artificial intelligence, et cetera, all the things we were all talking about today. So I think when you're looking forward at investments, whether it's 355 ships or more, I think there potentially could be a need for more, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the maritime domain is going to be the preeminent domain of competition uh, for the United States. Um, so you're going to have to make choices and, and accept risk in certain places. And if, if our allies and our partners are the, demo, are, are the center of gravity to our strategy, I think a lot of thought needs to be put into when we push more in the warfighting space, whether or not we can manage the downstream impact of what that means for our partners in terms of capacity building initiatives, et cetera, all the things that are kind of being deprioritized. Um, so that's sort of uh, uh, one piece. Um, I totally agree with uh, the sort of con the, the dynamic force deployment, the importance of operational concepts, because people tend to focus on systems and capabilities, but it's really actually how we fight that really needs to change and how we think about the adversary and how they're going to fight us. Yeah. Um, you know, I use uh, Russian meddling in the U.S. elections as kind of a, an example of this. Um, that is, a, for me, that's a Sputnik moment for the United States. Mm -hmm. The Russians engage in, in a kind of conflict and warfare that we don't 
engage in. And we talked about, you guys talked about this in the last panel. We need to be thinking, I'm not saying we should go meddling in the Russian elections, but I'm saying we need to be thinking differently about how we perceive conflict, how we perceive the adversary, how they perceive us, how they engage us and our allies, how they work uh, consistently to undermine confidence of our allies in the United States. I mean, the Chinese are quite effective uh, at using economic coercion uh, in the Pacific to undermine our security alliances. I mean, I remember, you know, going around Southeast Asia working on access agreements, and then like two days later, you know, the Chinese would show up with, you know, barrels of money for infrastructure investments in the Philippines or Vietnam, et cetera. Um, and so they use economic, their economic power uh, to try to dilute our, our security primacy. And so we also need to be thinking in economic terms. We tend to focus, I mean, obviously the NDS is focused on the military aspects of competition, but I think that the real fight is going to be in the economic domain, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. Russia is a different story, and I think it's important to make a distinction there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's excellent, and that's a great uh, transition or segue to Tarun because he's been involved in writing national security strategies and wrestling with the dilemma that China is a rival and a potential adversary and yet also a friend and a partner. And how does one reconcile all of this? Uh, DOD maybe doesn't face quite the conundrum that you did at the White House when you were working there because DOD can talk about China as a, from its point of view, a potential adversary and therefore it has to plan accordingly. But you, don't, you didn't quite have that luxury of simplifying China in quite such a straightforward term. So that's one question I would have for you in addition to anything else you want to comment on at this point in the conversation. Well, I think Kelly and I actually agree on, on a lot more than you suspect. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so and I'll talk about that in a minute. I mean, I, We've talked a lot about capability, and just to remind everyone, you know, the version of the national defense strategy that we've all seen is a summary of it that's public. What's behind it is classified, and that really lays out what's going on uh, in terms of force posture, investment, so on and so forth. And so only two people on the stage really know what's going on uh, uh, there. But Kelly's laid out what we, what we, what we, what we hope is in it. Um, uh, but I will say, just in terms of the framing of the national defense strategy, what I, I really appreciate about the framing is that there's always multiple audiences for a document like this, right? One is obviously the department itself uh, and directing the services, uh, laying out the, the secretary's priorities, uh, so on and so forth, but also our adversaries and our allies, right? And, and I think that we had previously leaned too far in directing um, the rhetoric to China and less to our allies. And so I appreciate the way in which um, I think the language of the NDS really projects reassurance and resolve, to borrow a title from Mike, um, uh, toward our allies. I think that's a really uh, important development. Um, Kelly and I, had about probably about four years ago, now we're, we're uh, flying together with Secretary Hagel to the Shangri-La Dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, uh, working on the speech that he was going to give there, going back and forth with the White House <laughs> on what language exactly uh, he would use to talk about what China was doing in the South China Sea at the time. Um, uh, and there was a lot of back and forth um, at the time. Uh, but my takeaway, really, from a lot of that was that there were two voices, really. The White House, largely at the time, I think, you know, um, wanted to, you know, let me say, the, the caricature would be, and this is not totally fair, the White House was still projecting a message of what our relationship with China could be, whereas I think the Defense Department was more focused on what we think it really is right now. Um, now, to be more fair, I think it's the Defense Department was focused on China's regional ambitions, what it was actually doing in Asia, and the White House was focused on what China was doing globally, which in many ways was more benign, right, at least for now. Um, and so I, I, think, I think now that focusing more on what China is actually doing in the region to our allies is actually um, very important. Um, uh, and, and another corrective, I think, is that I think we often uh, suggested to China and to our allies that de-escalation or short-term stability was an end unto itself, right? Rather than projecting that long-term stability was our objective, but in order to do that, we would reinforce our allies and we would stand by our allies and we would not submit to a Chinese grand strategy that over the long run wants to break our alliance system in Asia. Um, so all that I like. My, my worries, I think, have been laid out I mean, I, by Kelly pretty well. We don't have a coherent economic strategy, right? And that is what is driving so much of what's going on there. 
Uh, and a re very related concern is political interference, um, and Chinese political interference in Asia. You know, we, we have a lot of news about Australia, about New Zealand these days, but Australia and New Zealand are more open. Uh, they have a free press, more free academics. You know, I, I, we, I don't think we've seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's been happening in Southeast Asia when it comes to corruption, uh, covert tactics, um, uh, coercive tactics. Um, uh, so I, I think that that's where we need to be investing a lot more time and effort in understanding what's happening in those realms and having a coherent strategy to counter them. Outstanding. Uh, let me go with one more round of questions through the panel, and then we'll go to you. And we'll have till about 11.50. And we hope you all can stay for the 12 o'clock interview by uh, President John Allen, the head of Brookings, of one of his fellow Marine Four Stars, who is currently the Commandant, General Neller. So that'll be That'll be the, uh, the final event, but we've got a lot of time for discussion with you before that. And I just want to put one broad question on the table to follow up on where we've already been, and then ask each person to comment as they wish briefly, and don't feel the need to respond comprehensively. I want to ask about specific technologies and specific scenarios that concern you the most. And I'm guessing that we may hear more about scenarios at the end of the panel and more about technologies at the beginning, given people's sensitivities of, and relative areas of expertise, although all four could speak to all of this, I'm sure. But I guess I'd like to know, you've mentioned some of the uh, ideas already in terms of directed energy and hypersonics. We've heard it from the previous panel, um, undersea warfare, stealth. You, mentioned, you tick things off, but if you could maybe delve into a little bit more detail, just in a couple of minutes, on areas of technology over the next 10 to 20 years where you see particular promise for us, an opportunity, or particular peril, because we, we currently have vulnerabilities like in cyber, or somebody could beat us to the punch like in AI. And so, you know, some of the basic ideas are already out there in the public discussion, so I'm hoping to hear more your personal take on, on those sorts of things. And then, as we work down the panel, especially for Kelly and Tarun, if you have certain kinds of geographic settings you're most worried about, Baltic state scenarios, South China Sea scenarios, a Taiwan contingency, are there certain places where you, you think it's most likely for great power competition to come to a head and actually risk or potentially uh, lead to a risk of war. But we'll just work our way down and start with Secretary Harvey, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is still, a, in some ways, a nascent area within the department, sort of define it. It's, it's almost a little bit like venture capital, where you identify promising technologies that haven't been, been able to sort of determine exactly what their potential is and whether they are translatable into viable systems. But they do have promise, and so we are um, we feel bound to explore these. Hypersonics is one that gets a, a lot of attention these days, and it's one that we're focused on. You talk about the peril piece. Certainly, um, <clears throat> in terms of great power competition, the Chinese and Russians are investing a lot of money in hypersonic capabilities, and it, it, it's not um, a surprise to understand why. In terms of you're talking systems that travel at more than Mach 5, and so can overcome most defenses, can hold at risk at long distance, um, just about any type of forces that uh, you put in the field. And so this is an area that um, we are, are exploring uh, fairly heavily. Um, artificial intelligence is another one in terms of uh, its potential to allow us to process the myriad channels of information that come in in the modern battlefield and, you know, sort of hyperwar potential. Uh, things are moving so fast that it, it's hard for human cognition to um, absorb and process and react to all of those. So how does AI give us the ability potentially to, to stay ahead of, of that curve? Um, mentioned directed energy in terms of um, particular application in terms of missile defense uh, capabilities. And we have a missile defense review that um, is still ongoing in the department. But um, I mean, I think one thing we've looked at and the White House has actually talked about is holding at risk uh, potential missiles that uh, could be shot at us or our forces um, through the whole life cycle of a potential launch. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, that early stage of a launch where we could apply direct energy when it's most vulnerable is uh, an area we want to explore uh, by looking at applications of directed energy rather than just trying to use the catcher's mitt with a... Uh, you know, with a, a ground-based interceptor when it's, you know, exoatmospheric and going thousands of miles an hour. I mean, the most demanding piece of that 
um, uh, interception process in, in its cycle. So those, those are some of the technologies we're, we're looking at. Um, the challenge, and I think Kelly alluded to this, it's not just you know, the Buck Rogers technology, it's how do you translate that into a usable system and then how do you, from a concept of operations, how do you apply it? That's where I think the secretary has said we need to really focus attention. So there's, there's going to be parallel efforts as we invest in these technologies. How do we apply them and how does that change our investment streams? Okay. Um, as, a, as an example, do you need as many aircraft carriers as you have now if you have hypersonic and standoff capabilities where you can hold your uh, potential adversaries at risk uh, from long distance? Do you need to have as many carriers um, in, a, in a particular uh, you know, threat scenario? Um, just one example. Um, so we're, we're working through all that. The CONOPS is going to be just as important as the, as the system. Um, I'm reminded of World War One, you know, first development of tanks. There was a, a sense at the outset that you just distribute your tanks all along the front line, just parcel them out to all your units, rather than the the notion that was hit on, I think, first by the Good by the, by the the Brits, where you concentrate and use it as a spearhead. It's all about how you use the technology and apply it, not just the technology itself. In terms of scenarios, I think we're worried about a, a range of the ones you mentioned. Um, uh, as much for the potential miscalculation that's involved, especially when you have uh, the, the Russians, but also the Chinese sort of playing a game of chicken sometimes, the South China Sea particularly, East China Sea with the, with the Japanese and the Senkakus. Um, certainly the you know, buzzing of our ships by, by Russian aircrafts and others, there is a, a risk of, of miscalculation um, that, that could spiral there. And so we're very mindful of, of trying to warn off uh, adversaries to uh, potential adversaries to to not take those types of risk and not sort of send us into into some sort of um, spiral but um, uh, that that's all um, ongoing in the department and and uh, and I think we're we're mindful of of posturing ourselves in a way where we don't sort of contribute to the potential for those while also uh, you know asserting our interest as, as strongly as we need to but let me let me stop there and Okay, I'll cat. just riff off of each one of those. So working backwards, so um, when the Donald Cook had the flyby at 500 knots and at 10 meters uh, in, in the Baltic, um, what subsequently followed was the uh, annual incidents at sea. So that is a means of deconflicting. You know, U.S., previously Soviet, now Russian interactions in the air and on the seas. Um, I had the privilege of actually going to Moscow and sitting down and having those conversations. Pretty blunt, pretty direct, and pretty clear-cut in terms of, I don't care how skilled the pilot is, if you're at 10 knots and 500 knots today, I know pilots, I've worked for a few, next they're going to come back, they're going to show somebody a picture, and the next one's going to be 600 knots, yeah. 8 meters, uh, at which point it really doesn't matter. You're talking about the twitch of a wrist. Okay. The same kinds of things in the South China Sea, uh, when we look at the features, we look at the wholesale destruction of large coral reefs, um, the almost silence from the um, folks who would um, raise a ruckus um, if that happened off the coast of the United States, um, the complete and utter silence while that occurs in the South China Sea. Um, that should give you all pause and to go back to the economic conversations that we've been having. Um, when you look at the um, statements that were made that these will not be militarized, and when you look at what has transpired since then. So those are things that we think about. When you look at the capabilities that you buy, um, you know, there is a saying in one of the old biographies um, of, of a Navy admiral, the Navy never uses a ship for what it was purchased for, right? Aircraft carriers were initially developed to scout for battleships. Well, a few things happened along the way and things changed. Um, you know, the destroyers weren't necessarily for that purpose, and the PT boats weren't necessarily for the purpose that John F. Kennedy and his kin uh, used them for. So 
it, it goes back to the, this is what we have today, but the Secretary has given us strategic guidance as to this is what I want you to focus your efforts on. But it's not just buying the most impressive, new, bright, shiny object. It's the show me how you intend to use it. Mm -hmm. When we talk ballistic missile defense, whether you're talking about it um, e either sea-based or land-based, whether overseas or whether in the United States, the cost exchange ratio you know, one just needs to lob up and over and fall, right? And if you give it a bad enough warhead on it, precision is not necessarily important. If, however, you are trying to hit it, you are shooting a bullet at a bullet, mm -hmm. right? So it is inordinately more expensive to be on the defense side than it is on the other. If you can get to the directed energy portion where, either in the electromagnetic spectrum, whether it is you know, visible, whether it's lasers or whatever, you're able to interrupt that at a significantly lower cost per shot. Okay, I can afford to do 10 shots. Now, I will tell you that the flip side of that is the fact that if I have a kinetic, I know gravity will eventually cause it to bend and it will fall back to the Earth. Unfortunately, if I shoot a laser and it keeps on going and going and going, I have second, third, fourth, and fifth order effects as it moves its way through the atmosphere. So I have to really have a global view of our Earth and the surrounding atmosphere and everything in space before we start, and that's gonna be part of the ConOps, right? And so it's the, okay, I could buy this really cool umpteen megawatt laser. I could put it on this. Now give me the conops and the deconfliction and the processes that pulls that all together. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I want to follow up with, I'm glad you talked about lasers because, and I'm also glad we heard the lasers. spirit of defense of the littoral combat ship in the earlier session, but I'm nonetheless going <laughs> to rip off of uh, a, a, da a danger in talking about innovation um, and making it, you know, a even higher priority than it normally is, is that we Americans love our technology. And if you look at the history of our defense debates, we often think we can do things with technology that we used to need people for, and we usually wind up getting it wrong about every 20 or 30 years. Thank you. And I can think of you know, ways in which, whether it is the airborne laser mm -hmm. that the Air Force was developing until mm -hmm. Secretary Gates mm -hmm. decided it wasn't really a viable system, mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's the littoral combat ship that not everyone defends as, uh, as elegantly and eloquently as we just heard, or the Army's uh, future combat system. Sure. So 20 years ago, we had this big debate about the revolution of military affairs that was supposedly underway, and the Army said, we're gonna dance like a butterfly and sting like a bee, and we, we don't need 70-ton tanks anymore. We're gonna build these 20-ton future combat systems that know when they're getting shot at and can evade or defend or deflect, and it turned out to be a, a big mistake, to be blunt. Uh, technology wasn't ready to deliver on what all of us think tank people and other visionaries were saying we should be trying to do. How do we avoid that risk in, in, in this current phase of sure. innovation? So you got to be able and willing to fail, right? You have to be straightforward with your customers, right? Us to the third deck, the services to the hill and everybody else. <clears throat> so the revolution that occurred, you know, and we'll just take one portion of it, is the idea that you know, from World War II to today, you know, you had to send swarms of B-20 whatever version you want with 16 people on board to drop hundreds of guided bombs to hopefully hit the target. And today, you have one or two with long range, low observable, precision guided, day, night, good weather, bad weather, straight to the target, and you have two people. And so you'll, the, the, the challenge of the unmanned is the footprint that it buys you back home, right? The problem is you're putting so much, the, the alternative is you're putting so much money into training your pilot and air crew for a limited lifespan, okay? Then what is the survivability of that air crew mm -hmm. in terms of putting it up against double digit, triple digit SAMs and those kinds of things? So there is a tension there of the maybe there's a mix, right, of unmanned and manned. Maybe there's an opportunity to not just do large 2,000 pound bombs, but small diameter bombs, but precise, and be able to send in numbers of those. And then there's a the question of standoff. And so, the experimentation, 
which you're going to have to, and you're going to fail. And that's a good because, I mean, Edison's the best example of that, right? And then you turn around and you say, well, what's the concept? But each iteration, it's kind of like when you said, what's the right number of ships? What's the right, well, okay, number meaning these particular specific platforms with these specific capabilities. But as you experiment, you say, well, wait a minute, that's good, but if I change this, it changes the capabilities, the strengths, and the weaknesses. Does that make sense? Yep, it's great. Okay. Can, can I just add one? Please. Just one point. First, I didn't mean to denigrate the LCS. If I'm stepping on it, it, it has very useful applications. It's just not. It's just not <laughs> going to necessarily be the the front line defender in a uh, in a in a high end fight. <laughs> but I would say what what we're I think we're trying to do and look at in terms of the acquisition process. And it's not my area of expertise. But we, we've had some reorganization in the department, and so we have a research and engineering undersecretary now, whereas that used to be bundled under our acquisition um, <clears throat> head before. And so you've got someone, Mike Griffin, who's absolutely focused on identifying those potentially winning technologies and moving forward quickly with them. And I think what we want to try and do is do rapid prototyping and testing to see sort of whether we have something that is applicable to the types of challenges. So you don't have these sort of long, drawn out cycles of, of development and you know, get 10 or 15 years down the road and then realize that you, you've hit a dead end. So move as quickly as possible and give incentives and drive industry to help us be, be our partners in the, the quick evolution of that so we can, we can decide whether something is gonna be um, useful or not on a much tighter timeline than we have in the past. Excellent. Kelly, over to you. <laughs> uh, Any and all of the above. <laughs> uh, so I worry about a lot of scenarios. Um, I have a very long list uh, here. Um, it's probably why I'm in the business. Um, so the first, uh, you know, I agree with the Admiral, uh, the potential for miscalculation I think is pretty high, uh, both with the Russians and the Chinese, whether it's in Syria mm -hmm. um, or whether it's flying over the South China Sea and the air incidents mm -hmm. that could potentially occur. And we know the Chinese pilots get to a little sporty on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, so I do really worry about uh, accidents. Uh, I do worry that a P3 incident today would look very different than a P3 incident in 2001. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's really important for the United States and China and the United States and Russia to have channels of communication uh, and, and coordination in, in certain respects to avoid some of these accidents. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis in the Obama administration on confidence building measures in the maritime and air uh, domains um, in about 2016, I think 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. It'd be good to see those extended and deepened because I do think, you know, as the Chinese become more capable and there are more ships and there are more planes in the space, we're, it's pretty crowded. Mm -hmm. uh, airspace is pretty crowded uh, on the seas. And so accidents could really potentially happen. So that's one piece I worry about. But I really worry more about uh, strategic miscalculation. Um, either by us or by our adversaries. And in that sense, you know, like North Korea, I think, uh, you know, a preventive war in North Korea would potentially lead to a U.S.-China conflict. Uh, we've seen this movie before. Mm -hmm. um, and that worries me. So if we make a calculation um, and then don't think about the potential follow-on consequences, that is something that concerns me. I worry about Taiwan uh, still. The Chinese... Uh, still view Taiwan as uh, it's sort of the organizing principle for their war plans and how they, they plan. Um, and so we need to be thinking in those terms. Taiwan's very tough for us. Uh, distance is not our friend mm -hmm. uh, in this scenario. And so it's really important that we work with our, our Taiwan friends to ensure that they have the right capabilities, asymmetric capabilities, and ability to defend the island uh, for as long as possible. The Chinese are also going to try to smother uh, Taiwan with economic power. So that's another place, again, back to the use of Chinese economic power. Um, I also worry about uh, strategic stability, uh, especially increasingly between the United States and China. Um, we've never had a really good dialogue <laughs> uh, with China on these issues, despite multiple attempts to establish one. And you know, as we look at you know investments in missile defense, uh, for integrated missile defense, for example, I think we need to be having uh, strategic stability conversations uh, with China. We need to better understand their nuclear uh, program and deterrent. They have been very reluctant uh, to engage in any kind of transparent conversation on those issues with us. And so that is an area um, for for me. We're looking over the horizon. I worry a lot um, about down the road. And I think. You know, the NPR, 
um, and sort of the investments in that, I think we've got to be conscious of that, especially also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Russians. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the big ones um, from my perspective that I am concerned about. To, to the technology point, just real quick, um, you know, I, the question on the previous panel was if you had a billion dollars, any of the services, where would you invest it? Um, it was a good thing you probably weren't here for that question. Um, <laughs> but We were outside. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if I had an extra billion dollars to give to the Department of Defense or any of the services, um, I would actually give it to the State Department um, or, or the research and development, uh, national research and development, which has been cut dramatically, actually. So if we're going to compete uh, with the Chinese, especially in the long term, you know, national research and development, investment in education and science and math, uh, that's how we're going to compete. We're going to compete through our human capital. Uh, more so than I think even our, our defense. So just to add a little less. Seven, $700 billion doesn't go as far as it used to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> billion. Thank I'll you. Take it. <laughs> to ruin. So, so interestingly, if, what, you know, during the, during the transition to the Trump administration, one of the things that uh, the office I worked in did was generate a bunch of nightmare scenarios that uh, we thought they not only ought to think about but ought to know how various departments would respond, so that if they didn't like any of it, they could start thinking about that sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, so since I've willfully forgotten all of those now, um, just personally, I would just add to what you know Kelly said on accidents, I totally agree, I'd written down P3 as well, the Donald Cook incident, which Kat mentioned. Uh, I'd also, I'd add to that pile a cyber incident in which, uh, you know, uh, it's just gone, the operation has gone wrong and then really, um, destroys critical civilian infrastructure, yeah. um, and uh, that's one that I really worry about. Um, uh, misunderstandings. Kelly mentioned strategic stability. You know, a colleague the other day was saying in a, you know, a track two discussion with the Chinese, um, they were talking about escalation scenarios, and, and his Chinese counterpart said, "Well, you know, to de-escalate the situation, we would just immediately shoot down your satellites, right?" <laughs> and, mm. and he yeah. suggested that might not be the best idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that kind of conversation is what we mean specifically when we're talking yeah, about to strategic self. stability <laughs> conversations. Um, and then another one I worry about is 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 playing out the political interference scenario, mm -hmm. where we have the destabilization of a U.S. ally, where in particular we have mm -hmm. a lot of U.S. troops, personnel, and strategic assets. Uh, that kind of scenario. On on the technology um, uh, point, I, I I think that you know as as Todd was mentioning, you know. There's a lot of uncertainty about where these new technologies are going to go, how they're going to be applied, whether they're going to favor the offense or the defense. And we know that when that happens, especially where it's ambiguous, mm -hmm. that, that um, accentuates a security dilemma. And my view is that we're already in a security dilemma with, with China uh, and that this is going to make it even harder. Uh, and I don't see any way around that. You know, I don't think that there's any discussions that we can have at this point uh, with Beijing or anyone else uh, about norms in, when it comes to developing artificial intelligence on the technology development or application itself. Where I think, that when it, so what I think that means is that we need to be as clear as possible about our red lines and what our ends are and what we can and cannot accept uh, uh, so that we're separating to some degree this question of capabilities from what they're going to be used to do. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's where we, I think, should be investing most of our time in those discussions. Well, before we go to the audience, that leads me to one final question for you. Red lines, uh, a, a fraught topic. And if we think back to the confirmation hearings of soon-to-be Secretary of State Tillerson a year and a half ago, he proposed that a red line should be that we not allow China even to keep the reclaimed islands that it had built or certainly not to access them, and certainly not to build any more. That was by a guy I think of, you know, whatever his legacy proves to be, as a pretty cool, experienced man in international affairs. But he said something that could have led to war over the destruction of coral reefs, which is unfortunate. But otherwise, frankly, by the standards of history and when great powers rise, this is a relatively benign action compared to a lot of what great powers have done historically. Mm -hmm. So how do you avoid getting into a red line that you tie your own hands and you actually provoke a crisis rather than deter it. It's for you, Tarun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> go, go, Tarun. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, look, I, 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 I mean, there's always a tension, obviously, between there, there are, there's a trade-off between their benefits from some degree of strategic ambiguity and also from having red lines. We, we all know that uh, very well. And I don't think there's any way to do this other than iteratively where we're having an ongoing conversation with our adversaries about this problem. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's a, I, I haven't found it, and maybe, maybe, maybe our colleagues here uh, have a, have a one-sentence solution to this problem. Okay, I'll jump on that one. <laughs> so I had the privilege of uh, spending an hour with Secretary Schultz um, in uh, San Francisco at the San Francisco Fleet Week, and uh, he uh, he and I discussed it, and, and because it it is one of those things where if you set one, you must absolutely must follow through on it because of what it does internally, what it does externally across your allies, your partners, your friends, the folks who are sitting on the friend, your competitors, and, and then those who are preparing to conduct actions against you um, in the violent extremist organizations. It is an extremely strong message. So to go to what you said, which is the there are times for strategic ambiguity because that is helpful, you know, and that's why you have the track one, the track two, those kinds of conversations so that it's not necessarily on the record, it isn't being quoted, and it certainly isn't an authoritative fo uh, voice. But there are also times when it's the don't do that, and I meant it. And then you start to get us, oh, okay, got it. And then it, it goes back to what Kelly was saying earlier. <coughs> Coordination, not necessarily. Deconfliction, absolutely. And the ability to be able to have a conversation to say, this is not helpful and this is inherently dangerous and you need to understand what these actions can and will lead to. Those lay the groundwork for if you progress down that road, then you're in a position where you are able to have that conversation and where somebody in a decision-making role, because none of us are, right? We support the decision-makers, are then able to say, okay, don't go any farther, said privately, and then if it continues, then publicly, that's a red line, don't do that. Does that make sense? It, it, it is a continuum. It is not just a, if you say it without all of that prep work ahead of time, kind of put yourself in a corner. Excellent. Thank you. I'd like to go to you all now. Uh, we have microphones, so please wait for one after I call on you, and, and please keep your question relatively short. Let's take two at a time, and then we'll come back to the panel, uh, at least for round one. So why don't we begin uh, here in the sixth row with the gentleman. Uh, yes, right here, and then, we'll, and then we'll come up to the second row for round one, and then come back. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the panel. My name is Dimitri, and my question is for Mr. Chabra, as uh, you worked for, uh, at a very high level at the United Nations. It seems to me like in after, World War, after World War II, we created the United Nations to manage great power uh, interactions and security. Is that still the goal or the paradigm, or is it something else? And if it is, what should we be doing to reform the UN or going in another direction? Thank you very much. And then we'll come up here to Dan in the second row for the... Uh Final question of round one. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, Commander Dan Keeler, I'm the Navy Fellow here at Brookings. So it was alluded to on the, uh, some of the answers. The underlying economics um, of our nation going forward, um, not as promising as someone like Brookings had a study come out this week that just outlines the fiscal outlook and it's not good. Everything we discussed costs money. So how, uh, do, is it a strategic communication thing? Do we need to start talking uh, more openly than maybe in closed sessions with Congress about what we're going to ask the American people to pay for to execute the national defense strategy? Is it a problem, or is that uh, out of our lane, so to speak, in the department? Is that the president's job or, or Congress? Thanks. Great. So why don't we start with Tarun, because I think question one was primarily to you, and then we'll just, not everybody needs to answer both questions, but we'll just work down the, down the path. Yeah. No, it's a great question on the UN, and we have colleagues here, the director of our program, Bruce Jones, who's working on this question about UN reform. Um, you know, I, I mean, you can take a look at how things are working if you look at, you know, how the response to the um, use of chemical weapons in Syria, right? Um, and the ways in which uh, I think Russia is, is, is using even um, information gathering, right, as a weapon to prevent it from happening. And, 
And so, uh, you know, what's interesting is if you go back, um, you know, to the 2004 or 5 period when you know, Kofi Annan was the Secretary General, there was a lot of discussion about reforming the Security Council to make it larger, to include emerging powers, uh, to include India, maybe Germany, and Japan. But, but the challenge has always been that there is a trade off between representation and then the agility of the Council, on the other hand. Um, and I think that the reason you are now seeing less of that discussion is that even if you ask many of those aspiring powers to the council, they see they are concerned uh, about what even th their presence in a larger council would look like in terms of its effectiveness and its ability to manage tension between uh, the powers. Great. Kelly, for that or the other question, as you wish. Sure. I'll take on the uh, underlying economics question. I, you know, before in acquainter times, <laughs> whenever I would travel in Asia, uh, the first thing that Asians would raise with me was two things. Our political dysfunction at home, seriously. Um, the fact that we couldn't you know, pass budgets, tons of government shutdowns, debt ceiling drama, like that was like number one talking point about worrying about American decline. They talked about political dysfunction, they talked about economic solvency. So I, I, I agree with you. I think it is time for these conversations to be had. And I think, alluding to my earlier point about economic competition, we have to be thinking about national security in much broader terms than we currently think about it. We have to figure out how to restore the basic economic compact that we have with the middle class in America. We have to figure out how to invest in education so that our high school students, when they get to college, can actually you know, perform. That's a real pro There's a huge gap in high school education. Yeah. Infrastructure, I mean, the president himself has talked about this. I mean, our crumbling infrastructure at home, income disparity. I mean, I think essentially, if you're looking at, in, in the competition terms, you know, the US model versus the China model, we've got to make our model compelling if we're going to compete. And we have to help improve the ability of democracies to remain democracies globally. So figure out you know, incentive structures to keep you know, countries from going the direction of Hungary or Poland. Um, so these are, it's a bit of a broader answer to your question, but I think you've hit the nail on the head in terms of like, it's time for these kinds of big conversations in the context of national security. Care to comment on either of these or should we go to another round? I would just say the Secretary, Secretary Mattis has said we can afford survival. And so we need to, you're right, we need to have that dialogue with Congress. And I think we have, and, and the Secretary has reached out and the Chairman has reached out. And that's why I think you saw the defense budget that you did uh, for this uh, next two year uh, period. Um, but I think there is, there are the underlying dynamics of sort of how do we do this in the future? Because we've had, I think, continuing resolutions 10 out of 12 years. And it's just not a way to budget for an operation where you have to have predictability to plot your trajectory over, over multi-year programs. And so we, we would urge Congress to, to fix the way they, they work that piece um, and ensure that we have the resources that we need to, and recognize that there's going to be a fairly high price tag associated with, given the types of systems and the sophistication, both of what we need to buy and what our adversaries, pension adversaries are buying. <laughs> Quick follow-up on that, because Dan's also written about this, and I think you just hinted at a similar argument. Uh, historically, the Pentagon would complain that Congress funded its own pet projects, its parochial interests. Yeah. Yeah. These days, I hear more commonly, I think what I heard you just say, which is predictability is almost yeah. the main thing you need Abs now. Absolutely. And on-time budgeting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Indispensable right now. It's the biggest, biggest drain on our ability to sort of project out what we can buy and, and, and keep us on track because you're not allowed to start anything, right? Mm -hmm. Once you go into a continuing resolution, yeah. the law is very specific. You're not allowed to start new buys, new contracts, or anything else. And we have this perverse practice where, because we've had constraints on our base budget, we move things over to the overseas contingency camp, which is one-year money. So that's not a way to program over multiple years when you have to sort of bargain for that every year. You have to negotiate, and you don't know what level that's going to be at. So. Great. Let's go to another round. We'll start over here in the second row, and then I'll stay on this side. Uh, the woman in the about eighth row will be uh, my second for this round. I'm impressed you can count rows. Huh? I'm guessing, <laughs> yeah. Let's see, how, how, how did I do? Five, six, yeah, nine. Close. I was one You're off. Close. Well, close. Yeah, closer than I was with your identities at the beginning. <laughs> 
Sizz Mill, we're like this. That's right. That was it. That was the problem. My name is Jim Connors, and my question for the panel is, given America's open and anonymous internet, do each of you consider that a competitive advantage or a competitive weakness? Great, thank you. And then my friend in, in the ninth row on the aisle. Yes, woman in the blonde hair. See what I mean? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to Please ask, identify yourself if you could. Yes, uh, Alexa Van Ann with Spitzberg Partners in New York. Um, I wanted to ask the panel to discuss the state of the conversation about militarization of the internet, similar to the first question, and then also to comment on how we are using cyber as a tool of state power and basically kind of how we're signaling to our allies and our enemies what we're doing with that. There's some pretty big picture cyber questions. <laughs> don't, don't feel obliged to address all dimensions, but, but you, would you like to start, Mr. Secretary? Or? <laughs> sure. Um, I, the, the cyber challenge is one that is um, multidimensional, and uh, I don't think we have um, hit on, no surprise, hit on the solution and what the dimensions of our investments should be, ought to be for this. Um, we have, I think, in a, in a pretty significant way over the past so five years, started investing resources in, and it may be counterintuitive, but cyber activities are actually very labor intensive. And so one of the first tasks has been to hire enough people so that we can sort of man these uh, cyber teams. Um, and there, there are different categories. I think we have about 113 cyber teams overall, uh, some sort of focused at the, sort of what we call the national mission level, and then some to protect DOD networks uh, some to help develop tools that we can use uh, with our combatant commands against potential adversaries. So there, there are different categories we've, we've begun to, to focus on, but I, I think we still have a long way to go to develop the, the, the right uh, response. Uh, and a big piece of this is developing the authorities that we need. Um, you know, we are, we are vulnerable now, both um, from a DOD standpoint and from a sort of national cyber infrastructure standpoint. And so we are, I think, very much aware that any, any action we take can engender a, a reaction. And so we need to make sure we have the protections in place, uh, even as we develop sort of offensive capabilities. But understanding sort of what decision space and what latitude you give to your combatant commanders to, to use tools and when to use those tools, um, distinctions between sort of uh, uh, offensive action and in, intelligence gathering, is, is obviously a dividing line. Um, you, you may not necessarily want to take action even when you have opportunities because it burns your, your access. It, it exposes you from an intelligence standpoint where you're collecting information. So there's a whole bundle of, of issues here that we're, we're beginning to tackle. And I think you know, having Cyber Command stood up on its own I think is, is a, a, a good starting point, but uh, there's a lot of work to do there. Quick, a quick question before you go on. Where does Cyber Command stand exactly? Is it still, it's supposed to be a completely separate combatant command, and it will get there, but it's still sort of being born, right? And, it is. And there's still a dual hatting of NSA. NSA. Yeah, and that that's, would be the next step is sort of the separation of NSA right. and, and Cyber Command. And, and that'll take roughly another year? Uh, I would say within the year. Within the year. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. General Nakasone has been confirmed. He will eventually relieve Admiral Rogers, um, and he then owes a report back that basically says, okay, this is my way ahead in order to, in accordance with the Secretary's guidance. Right. Okay. Um, but, I mean, for a moment, to appreciate what Admiral Rogers has to do, right? So, turns here, he has the Title X folks saying, hi, we have this, this is a legitimate target, this is in accordance with the rules of engagement, this enables us to do the following things. Got it. Turns over here, and he's still talking to himself, Title 50, <laughs> right? Yeah. Intelligence the entire yeah. intelligence com community saying, you can't do that, right? I mean, and it's when I explain it to, to, to my folks, it has to be in you know, fourth grade English on class. So it's the, I want to climb up the tree in Kelly's yard, drop onto the roof, go over, lift up the, uh, the skylight, reach down, grab the diary off the bedside table, and do this. And then the Title 50 folks come on and say, no, 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 no. What you can do is you can stand in the yard across the street, and if they happen to open their windows and they happen to have the book open, you can read it. <laughs> Other than that, 
If you go anywhere near that house, you'll break up this access, which enables us to do this, which enables us to do all these things. And so that is kind of the conversation he has been having 24 seven for his entire time as NSA Cybercom. And it's an incredibly challenging one. And so what will eventually happen is you'll be able to have two personalities going back and having that conversation. So just an appreciation of the proliferation of stuff that's on the internet. Your, your question was, do, is it an advantage? Absolutely. I mean, look at how much bad press Facebook received in the last, right? And look at their numbers for the first quarter, right? It is a huge economic engine. All of us have benefited from it, right? I mean, maybe not Toys R Us, but all of us have benefited from it, right? It has dramatically changed the way we do business. It has dramatically changed the ability for folks to share information. None of the big data AI stuff would have come along a fraction as quickly as it has if there wasn't a profit motive behind it, right? And so that has brought us, and so we are now looking at going, wow, well, we're not in the making of dollars and cents kind of business but it could help us with, I've collected this enormous amount of information, how can I then sift through it and be able to parse that out? So I think, yes, it's a tremendous advantage. It's a huge economic engine. It's going to change the way, to go to what Kelly said, you train, teach, and educate in generations, not only what and how. And then further on, it's an enormous weakness, right? Because it yeah. is based upon the idea that We'll go with a physical example. Doors are open. Kids roam the streets free. Nobody drives too fast down the street. Kids can play, throw. There's no bad people. There's no crime. OK, to a point, right? And then there's the reality of what the internet is, right? There is the dark web. There is people exfilling data. There are people stealing identities. There are people intercepting stuff as attachments, modifying it, setting it on. That's in banking, that's in everywhere, okay? So yes, to both of your questions, it's a huge opportunity and also a huge vulnerability. The challenge that we have is, to go to your question, is we are in the job of protecting our networks. And when the rest of the country looks around and says, that's really cool, there are some civil libertarian issues to be had and a conversation mm -hmm. that the nation has, and it ain't our job to be blunt, right? It's Homeland Security, FBI, a whole host of other folks whose job is to protect everything other than the dot mill. Now, do we ride on the same backbone networks and switches to a large extent that everybody else does? Sure, you couldn't recreate a duplicate one if you wanted to. But our stuff, encrypted, lots of protections, reduced number of points of presence, that kind of stuff. The cost for that across the .com, across the .gov, that's a different conversation, and the American people have to have that. Can we help? Yes. Do we help DHS? Since the beginning, right? But it's different, right? We own ours, right? We don't own .com, and we certainly own .gov, but we certainly help them. Does that make sense? Does that kind of get at both your questions? Great. Okay. Kelly. I'll just, real quick. Is our openness an advantage or a disadvantage? It's both, I agree. Uh, it's advantage for all the reasons the Emerald lay out, laid out, but it's also a disadvantage. And I think if we're looking at competition with China uh, and Russia, we've got to be designing strategies to address the fact that they do try to exploit our openness to their gain. Mm -hmm. Whether that's the internet or whether it's the WTO, they're trying to find ways to draft off of our openness here, but also the openness of the international system. So that's point one. On the cyber as a tool of, of uh, state power, I leave it to these guys on sort of the command authorities, et cetera. Um, I think at the national command authority level, though, uh, there is not a very good understanding or set of protocols around you know, cyber conflict and cyber competition. Uh, so you know, what is a cyber act of war? Like, I, I, you know, I don't think that there is a very good answer to that question. Is it like pornography? You know it when you see it. Um, is there a set of protocols that you initiate when you see certain thresholds reach? Is it, is it when it's an attack on civilian infrastructure? Uh, is it when somebody dies? You know, that kind of uh, strategy conversation uh, and set of understandings is not yet, I think, established uh, in the U.S. government. So I think that is 
uh, potentially a very big challenge for us going forward, especially given uh, the, the investments that the Chinese are making and the Russians uh, in cyberspace as, as a tool of war. And Tarun, any thoughts? I would just say on, on the openness question, I think we need to remind ourselves that uh, you know we can think about, we, and we should think about the vulnerabilities of openness and so on, but openness is also who we are and it's what we're trying to secure in the first place. And so we have to, we have to recommit ourselves to that. And I think the, the hardest place for this is often in the business world where the Chinese are, are, are often using coercive tactics requiring certain things to be done in order to, in order to, uh, to, to provide market access right in China. And yes, many American companies are global but there has to be a conversation with them, which is about whether they are American companies or, at a minimum, whether we share certain values, right? And that's our, that, that's our, that's our to me, our biggest point of vulnerability in the conversation that we're not yet having. Great. Good time for one more round of questions. And I think maybe since there are still quite a few hands, I'll take, I may take, um, to test your memories, four. And, and, and then oh. my hope is that there'll sort of be a perfect natural alignment of, of one question per respondent. And, and then we'll just finish up with that round. That's a heck so, of a synchronization. Yeah, there. That's a big, big hope. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we, um, we'll start, a, start over here on this side. And uh, we'll take the gentleman in the light blue shirt, and then the gentleman in the purple shirt, the gentleman in the fourth row, and then the woman here in the front row. That'll be it. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. With apologies to others. My name is Jake Sweely. I'm a graduate student at the Elliott School of International Affairs. And my question is, uh, so Russia and China have obvious political advantages when it comes to uh, executing a long-term uh, whole-of-government strategy. So my question is, what is the United States doing right now, or what should it be doing to implement its own grand strategy for the 21st century that is whole of government, consistent across region, and most importantly, consistent between administration? Easy. Tarun's going to take that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I think it's okay. your turn to start. <laughs> Pur purple shirt here in the fifth row, please. Hi, my name is, Hi, my name is Ben. Um, we talked a lot about uh, the Chinese kind of economic uh, interests in developing countries and, and how they're kind of using that to maybe promote their their own uh, interests. Um, what we haven't really talked about a lot, but seems to be a kind of theme, is America's kind of retreat in terms of maybe aid or diplomacy or even free trade. Um, uh, generally speaking, I think China doesn't have the same human rights concerns that America has, and I think in a broad sense, maybe human rights violations might be root causes of a lot of conflicts. So is there any concern that with China's, China's engagement and America's maybe retreat in certain regions that we are allowing the seeds of future conflicts to emerge there at the same time that we seem to be pivoting towards major power conflict and away from uh, those civil wars or extremism or whatever you want to call it? Thank you. And then the gentleman here right in front. I'm uh, Robbie Harris, a former naval person. Hey, Robbie. Tempted to ask a billion dollar question again, but I won't since mm -hmm. Kelly's already answered it. Hey, during the previous administration, the, the Carter work uh, regime, uh, a lot of the emphasis was placed on the SCO office, the Strategic Capabilities Office. Mm -hmm. Break, break. Uh, the current strategy emphasizes innovation. Given that emphasis, that emphasis on innovation, why is, it that, why is it that SCO is no longer a direct report to the Deputy Secretary. Okay, and then finally here in the front row. Hi, Mary Archer, Department of State. Um, thank you for a wonderful panel um, so far, and thank you in particular to Kelly for the, for the extra dollars. billion dollars. <laughs> 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 um, my question is, um, basically, we enjoy a fantastic working relationship with DOD uh, and other agencies yeah. on these issues. Um, from planning sort of on down. Uh, my question for you all would be, what would be the one additional thing that we could all think about to make that collaboration more seamless across all of our elements of national power um, in this context? Thank you. Great. So I think, Mr. Secretary, we'll start with you. And you can really take whichever. Feel free to just take one. Or if you want, maybe two at most. And we'll just work down the, the panel. I'm at a disadvantage because I didn't bring pen and paper. Well, so I mean, no, no, so I, I've got. I'll start ready. with. Sorry, yeah, Mary. that's good. Yeah, Mary used to work him off, so <laughs> good to see you again. Great. Um, so I, I think, um, given where you sit, um, the, the secretary, our secretary, 
um, has, is very mindful, as Kelly mentioned, right on the mark in terms of the importance of, of allies and partners. And that's one of the you know, main pillars of the Secretary Mattis's approach to how we engage with the world and how we sort of protect our security interests. So we have a, a finite pool of resources that we use from a, from a security standpoint to sort of build capacity capabilities for our partners. So how do we better lash together what you do with FMF, foreign military financing funds, with what we do on our side with Title X funds that we have, which is not an insignificant amount of money. Um, the, the Hill earmarks uh, probably about 85, 90% of your foreign military finance, so we don't have a lot of flexibility there. But are, are there ways that we can better um, tie our efforts together and apply those resources, not in a peanut butter spread, not based on sort of political calculation, but where we think we get the, the most benefit from a security standpoint in terms of bolstering partners and allies who are going to be standing with us in meeting some of these challenges at the, you know, with the great power competition. Um, so so I, th I think that's one. Um, there is, to the question of how do we come with the whole of government, you know, I've heard some commentators um, uh, inside and outside the government say that China and Russia don't have a whole of government approach, they have a whole of society approach. And that's a benefit when you have an authoritarian regime with a strong man at the top who can basically direct the resources of society, um, whether that's, you know, biker gangs that drive across Eastern Europe, you know, church assets, um, all sorts of, uh, you know, putatively non-governmental assets and organizations. Uh, I think we would, we would sort of... <laughs> be very satisfied with a uh, very um, well-integrated whole-of-government approach. And uh, certainly in uh, Asia and to a certain extent on uh, Europe, uh, the NSC is taking the lead on sort of pulling together um, uh, particular focus right now on an Indo-Pacific strategy that ties together based on the guidance from the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and ultimately rework uh, national military strategy. Sort of what are the, what are the um, priorities that we see and how do we synchronize our work across all, all government agencies? Because I think as you alluded to, there's, there is a, a very real prospect of us going in our own directions. But having that lineup of strategic documents come out sort of in the sequence that you typically would like it to, but we never seem to achieve. But now that we have that lineup, how does it translate into action? Coming up with the implementation plan for that across the government is the, the real high bar for us right now. But, but we're mindful of that, and I think we're, we're focused to, to make that happen. Excellent. I'll stop there and give others Perfect. Chance. Admiral, one or two for you, as you wish. Sure. Um, yeah, what did Churchill say? It's the worst form of government except everything else. Mm. Um, what happened when we changed governments? Uh, Al-Qaeda assumed that the United States was monolithic. Surprise. Um, the reactions you saw from a previous administration to an attack on an embassy, two embassies simultaneously is not the reaction you'll get when a different group of people is running the same country. Uh, and that's, that's, that's good. I mean, it, it goes back to, you know, it, it's messy, but it's realistic. But what you will also see with the, and, and getting to work for a guy who reads tons of history, um, is when you look backwards with the clarity of 2020 hindsight, right? Because at the time, all you know is it's kind of like the Battle of Gettysburg. We know more about the Battle of Gettysburg than the people who went through it. We know what everybody thought. We know what everybody was thinking. We've read their letters. We've walked the battlegrounds. At the time, all they knew was, oh, crap, here they come again, <laughs> right? So, but the neat thing about being able to look back and to read the history, particularly of the Cold War, of deterrence, of the grand strategies, is that you get to see that Geography hasn't changed. People, by and large, don't change. Maslow's hierarchy of needs doesn't change, right? The, the motivating force is for. Uh, and authoritarian regimes come and go, right? And so when you take that, then you can start to look and say, OK, what are the key things that we want to do? And then given where the NSS puts us, then to the NDS, got it. But the reality is, is that if you take just North Korea, yes, we're busy doing a whole bunch of, hey, what if kind of stuff, right? That's what we get paid to, right? It's in Title 10. We're required to plan for every possible contingency. And occasionally somebody writes an article and says, oh my God, this guy's falling. Um, but the reality is the vast majority of stuff that has been done in this pressure campaign is financial, right? 
it's economic, right? It is truly a whole of government. Um, and the, the neat part about our jobs is that if it's not happening this very second, it's strategy and policy, right? And so everything that is going across in the world in the military frame and to a large extent across the other pillars of government crosses our desks. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, as I tell my wife and kids, I am a mile wide and a millimeter thick. Mm -hmm. And so when, you know, somebody comes into me and says, okay, I need you to look at this staff action, I get a 20 minute education in that kind of stuff. But that's really what's happening across state, across the intelligence agencies, across treasury, across commerce, all of those. Um, Let me just do one more, because I'm cognizant. I'm, I'm not afraid of General Nellard, but I am afraid of John Allen. So, and he'll be coming soon, but please. Yeah. That was a great answer. There's the innovation question you may want to touch on the So report. I don't know why SCO isn't a direct report. Uh, e each different group comes in and, and puts it there. I can tell you that um, it is exactly the kind of stuff we are trying to get after. Uh, it is the kind of stuff that in my previous you know, tour in the Pentagon, this is my sixth job there, I got to see stuff going, hey, we have this, how could we use it in a completely different way? And I think it's an, and that's part of the way that I talked about it, which is you have what you have, how can you wire them together today? Instead of saying, I need to buy a new box that does this. No, I need you to also talk in fourth grade English. Now, if we get you all talking in fourth grade English, I can put in anything here, and I can shoot it and hit the target with anything on this side. And now it's just a question of, is it an Army person talking to a Marine aircraft, talking to a Navy ship, talking to somebody ashore? And, and does that make sense? So, so I don't know why it moved, yeah. but yeah. thank you. Yeah. Kelly, over to you. Um, I'll leave, again, the grand strategy question to Tarun, uh, who will answer it ably. Um, but I will say one thing. Uh, I think there is a mistake to think that just because China is authoritarian and can marshal resources and direct them to whatever they want, that they have some sort of advantage in grand strategy. Um, I don't think that's true, first of all. Second, I think you know, the, ch the good thing about the American model and system is that we can make mistakes and correct. We tend to correct our mistakes. We admit our mistakes and we mm -hmm. correct them. Mm -hmm. um, that is not necessarily the case in an authoritarian model. Mm -hmm. And so grand strategy, if you make a big blunder, like well, Iraq war, um, <laughs> you know, just putting it out there, um, you know, but look at where we are today. We're talking about, you know, strategic competition with Russia and China. Um, and so our system is able to correct itself uh, and to improve itself. So I think that is a, an advantage that we have that authoritarians do not have. I agree that you need to have an organizing theory uh, of the case for how you interact in the world. Uh, I think we're getting closer to that, some of the conversation we had today, but I'll leave it again to, to Tarun. Um, to your question about state and DOD planning, I, when I was uh, running strategic planning at the NSC, I'd have these interagency planning meetings where the state policy planning folks and the J5 and uh, the strategy office in OSD would show up. And it was like space aliens talking to each other. <laughs> um, and it's because we just, A, we plan differently. We plan on different budget timelines, different cycles. There's you know, the FIDIP there. We don't have that at the State Department. Um, it's much more iterative. So there is a cultural just difference in how we approach planning, which I don't know that we'll ever truly solve, and maybe we should, probably shouldn't really solve. Um, but the way to improve uh, seamless planning, if we ever can get to seamless, is to have as much interaction as possible at every level, whether it's at the cabinet level with weekly lunches between the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and the National Security Advisor, or it's at the tactical level. So you have desk officers you know, doing rotations at OSD policy, vice versa. The Joint Staff sends folks over to the State Department. I mean, that's where that sort of integration up and down the chain is how you get to a better planning process. You're never going to resolve kind of the cultural challenges, I think, of the institutions. But that's probably, not, that's probably a good thing, actually. That, that, fr that friction mm -hmm. uh, and difference of thinking result. is actually a good thing. You're going to get a better strategy. Mm -hmm. You don't want everybody looking like me, talking like me. I mean, Paul ads are worth their weight in gold, right? 
And finally, Tarun. Yeah. So yeah. So I'll, I'll be quick. I mean, and since I still I do take orders from Kelly, I'll I'll, I'll try it with Jake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I I'll turn the question back to you, Jake, in the sense that I mean, I I think it's going to require young thinkers, people like you, to make sure that the next election is not is is it has a major focus on foreign policy and a major focus on competition with Russia and especially China, right? And so I think it means that the you know, we need people saying that the next foreign policy debate, you know, or the next presidential debate spends half its time on this question, right? Or the foreign policy debate that's 90 minutes spends an hour of it on China, right? And um, I, I think one thing we do need to be aware of is, you know, many of us in this room care a lot about national security issues, and, the, and often the first place where we go when we talk about needing to spend more on defense or spend more on aid and diplomacy is to say, and so we just need to cut back on entitlements, right? And uh, I think we all need to have, you know, an honest conversation about possibly needing to do more abroad and more at home along the lines that Kelly mentioned, investing in education and innovation and so on and so forth. And that's going to cost a lot more money and that's going to scramble our politics. And I think we need to be ready and open to having that conversation. Great note to finish on. Please join me in thanking the panel. But before you do, we have 10 minutes or so for coffee break. You can please uh, go ahead and nourish yourselves and then come back. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.